Now we're going to look at Psalms 133. Only three verses. And I hear some of you, I can, th I can read your mind. Some of you are thinking, hmm, three verses, maybe it'll be shorter. Hmm, maybe not. <laughs> Psalm 133, we, when we look at the Psalms, the basic theme of the Psalms is living real life in the real world. But where, where two dimensions operate simultaneously. A horizontal, temporal, human reality and a vertical and transcendent reality. Without denying the pain, the battles of the earthly dimension, the people of God are to live joyfully, rooted in faith and trust, confidence and dependency on the person and the promises uh, are God standing behind the heavenly eternal dimension. Every cycle, now in the Psalms, all the cycles of human troubles and trials and triumphs and testimonies provide moments, occasion, opportunities for expressing our hearts, our fears, our tears, but also our faith, our joy, our questions, uh, but also our prayers, our faith, our worship, our hope. And uh, our absolute conviction that our God makes us overcomer through it all. Through it all by, his faith, by faith and by his grace and by his love. Now when you look at the Psalms that we would call the cycles or the rhythms of uh, uh, the Psalms. The, the uh, 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 sequences and uh, the chronologies, how the Psalms move and live. We find it are so close to our own walk with the Lord. You have, I would, I would uh, say this way, you have, you, have, you have psalms of orientation where, where the, the psalmist feels a, a direction. There are psalms of peace and confidence. And we have, uh, we have seasons like that. There are psalms of orientation. There are psalms of disorientation where you go from peace to the pit, from confidence to confusion. And there are psalms of reorientation where you find your purpose again in praise and conquest and change. Now, psalms of orientation are peace and confidence. These are the seasons in our lives where we feel a sense of direction, uh, uh, projects and hope. And, and we, uh, there's some seasons in our life that life makes sense. Everything is going, uh, we have our battles, but prayers are answered, uh, and blessings come, and God seems so close. These Psalms express the feeling that there is an order to things, and uh, 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 establish. we even saw seasons in our lives where we feel, if I do this, well then blessings are sure to come. They're, they're good seasons, they're, they're Psalms of peace and confidence, Psalms of orientation, but how many of you understand, and you can go through the Psalms and you go from one to the other that there's also psalms and seasons of disorientation. When we, go, when we go from peace to the pit and from confidence to confusion, these are psalms, you read them and you, it like mirrors to our hearts. Uh, the, 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 the psalmist write with a sense of pain or panic even, fear, confusion, betrayal, anger, a doubt in one psalm, uh, one psalmist in one psalm asks four, time the qu four times the question, how long, Lord? How many of you have been through how long, Lord, season? Say yes. Somebody says next to you, I'm, one, I'm, I'm in one now. <laughs> how long, Lord? Pit and confusion. I went from peace and confidence where everything makes sense. Now nothing makes sense. I thought I knew if I do this, blessing will come. I'm doing it. And, then, and confusion is coming. How long? How? When? Why, Lord? Here, orientation psalms, peace and confidence. These orientation, pit and confusion. And reorientation are these amazing psalms or purpose where we find our praise again. And conquest because God has changed us and he's, he's turned things. Now, these psalms, now when you read them, yeah, we, you, they're filled uh, with amazement at, at, at God's grace. And, 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 uh, and even surprise and shock at how God turned things around amazingly. And when I, I didn't know what was going on behind the curtain, he was there uh, at changing things. And he was walking before me and behind me. And he was surrounding me, one psalmist says. He was carrying me, one psalmist says. And these psalms... These psalms are always uh, uh, songs, uh, and they, they express God's purposes and conquests. Uh, our praise is back, but also change. Because please uh, remember this. God's, uh, God's ways, God's kingdom, God's purposes are never circular. 
They're never just to get us back. We never pray, God, bring me back to what I, where I was before. If things could only be like they were, God never only wants to get you back to where he was before. He has begun a good work in you. He has begun a work to transform you from glory to glory and battle to battle into the image of Christ. So we don't pray, God, bring me back to what I was before because God, when we go through, out of the pit, Psalms, out of the pit, we find purpose, we find peace again, Again, we find praise, but we find uh, also change and transformation. He has made us better. With God, it is always higher and better and deeper and truer and realer into the image of Christ. Say yes, please. Say to someone next to you, God has not finished changing you. Say that to somebody next to you. Now in every psalm, God, now in this Psalm 133, Three verses with outstanding potential and impact. The Lord brings us back to his heart, to his passion, to his priorities, to his kingdom purposes, his grace, his covenant, his will for us and in us, often forgotten, is call for supernatural unity, for, for spiritual unity. And it's a Psalm of David. It reads like this, Psalm 133. A serious call to spiritual unity, a song of ascents, a psalm of David. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of, this, of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon. Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Four thoughts in this psalm, the reminding of our unity, the revealing of our unity, the renewing of our unity, and the reasonable response of our unity. I want you to say to somebody next to you with a big smile, how sweet it is. Say that to somebody next to you. The psalmist said it, how sweet it is. There's a, the psalmist begins by, by reminding us. There's a reminding of our unity. When you read a song of ascent, a song of David, uh, it is a psalm, a, a psalm of elevation. Some translate, uh, trans, translate from, the, from the Hebrew, a song of degrees, as you would go up. The songs of ascent are 15 psalms between Psalm 120 and Psalm 134. And they are psalms. They, now these psalms uh, 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 have a very specific purpose. In Psalm 133, according to most uh, theologians or commentaries, was written upon a very special occasion when uh, the 12 tribes, tribes finally put an end to all their striving, all their strife, all their bickering, all their dividing. As they were uh, surrounded by enemy, they would, they would attack one another for supremacy and for who would be where. But finally, under the leadership of, uh, of David, they, they elect him as king and, uh, and they, God has chosen him. And there's a coronation moment uh, that we find in 2 Samuel 5. And, and in that moment where all the tribes finally come together, expressing God's purpose, purpose to have a people of unity uh, on the earth. David writes how amazing it is, how good, how powerful it is where, where people come of all by walks of life come together, where brethren come together in unity. It is like uh, oil that comes down Aaron's beard. It's like dew in the morning. It is the place. If you're looking for the blessing, people running around the nation looking for where is the blessing? There. That is the place where God blesses, where people come together. It was in that moment, but it was also a psalm of ascent. It was also a psalm that was to be spoken, to be taught, and to be sung to God and to one another as people would gather together to ascend to the house of God, ascend to the temple, as they would go, as a divine reminder of God's purposes. This is, what, this is what we do every Sunday. We come here to come together. We come to bless one another. We come to represent God's unity, God's heart, God's forgiveness, God's acceptance of all men, God's transcending bloodlines, community lines, social lines, bringing us together. This is who we are. This is what we do. They, they, God said you're going to prepare yourself. It is so easy for you to forget it. 
that I want you to prepare yourself as you are coming up, as you are ascending, as you are on the subway, as you are stuck in traffic, as you are having your bagel on Sunday morning at Starbucks, $11 bagel at Starbucks. And when you... And when you are coming in, when you are coming in, remind your heart of why you're here. You're not only here to receive, not only here to evaluate or to judge or to get something. You are here to give and to bless and to come together and to become God's heart. It's a, it's a sub point, but a very, a very, um, I, I believe it is a very valid uh, thing to think about again. The idea of how are you preparing yourself to come to church on Sunday? It used to be, uh, and for years and years, it would be, it would be a Sabbath. There would be a thought in many, many churches of, of setting Sunday aside for the things of God. And sometimes it fell into heavy legalism, and I understand all that. But I, I also believe that we could go to the other way where there's a certain uh, uh, flippancy, a certain callousness, certain, uh, I'm just, uh, so I'm asking the question, how, do you, how did you prepare yourself? Now, most of us would never think of coming to church without preparing ourselves physically, say yes. You know, I mean, it was my, uh, a week ago was, uh, 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 was my daughter's second anniversary. And I remember uh, on her wedding day two summers ago, uh, we were just before, uh, and, and I went into the, the room, and, and it was like a team of 11 ladies around her. I don't know. I'd never seen as much powder and, and creams and, and, and tools, all kinds of tools were used. I just walked away. I was afraid. I was fearful. I just walked out. Now, when I was in Bible school, um, and there was a lot of, of, of guys and girls, uh, uh, young men and young women uh, dating, and it was Bible school. Very, everybody's looking for God's will uh, for their lives. And uh, in Bible school, uh, people worship like this. Look, I don't have a ring. That's how they worship. And, uh, <laughs> but there was a fire. There was a fire in the girls' dorm in the middle of the night. So hundreds of girls, uh, young women, uh, it would have been the same for the guys, but had to come out unprepared. <laughs> it just came out. A hair and things were happening that just... <laughs> and it was just, uh, it would be the same for the guys, but, guys, but the girl, and it was strange because in the weeks that followed, there's some breakups that took place of guys that just... <laughs> I feel a leading of God to, to concentrate on Bible studies, you know. The psalmist says, prepare your heart. You're not coming uh, to a, the a theater. You're not coming to a ball game. You're not coming to work. Yeah, you're coming. Uh, you prepare yourself physically. That's fine. But you come and you prepare your heart. You prepare your soul. We have a purpose together. We have the purpose to shine who God is together to a broken and divided world. He says, behold, hima in the Hebrew means look, notice, stop, see, learn, be aware, pay attention. Don't forget. Don't take for granted. Don't take lightly the blessing of coming together as a people. I would even say this. Don't take the blessing in the U.S. after traveling to 35 countries. Don't take the blessing in the U.S. of the freedom we have to come here, not in danger, and to sing, and to worship, and to praise God, and proclaim God. Say yes, God. Thank you. The psalmist says how good, how rich, how amazing, how pleasant. He did not say how easy it is. That's why every verse in the Old Testament uh, uh, on that topic and in the New Testament, it takes it further by the work of the Spirit of God in us. He says make every effort, uh, everything you have to protect unity. Now when you look at the Psalms of Ascent, those 15 Psalms, over and over and over, they bring us the reminding of, the, of our unity. I'm going to read a few verses. Uh, I'm going to read some Psalms this morning. I'm not going to have you turn to every one of them. I've been coming here for 28 years. You'll see the video if you want and you can check, uh, fact check every verse. But for this morning, would you believe me that they are there? Say yes. yes. Psalm 120, verse 6 and 7, my soul. Psalm, Psalm of, uh, of coming up, reminding us of unity. Psalm 120, 6 and 7. My soul had dwelled too long with the ones who hate peace. Say out loud, too long. Too long. Enough. I am, I am for peace. But when I speak of peace and unity, they are for conflict, division, and war. When I speak of bringing together, they are for breaking apart. When I speak of building up, they are for tearing down. There's still a day, there's still a, 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 a Christian, a man, or a woman of God that understand that to please God's heart, we have some time to say enough. 
Enough of the bickering. Enough of the bringing back what you, that a person perceives as an offense. Enough of coming into church or out of church with uh, the tearing down. When I, when I want to speak of the good things, they speak of, uh, of conflict. When I want to speak of the blessing, they speak of what's tearing us apart. God is raising up a people that understand. There's a reminder here. I have a purpose. I have a role to play. I have a calling. I have a mission to be one who brings peace and healing and everything I do and say. Psalm 122, 29. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's a song, a psalm of ascent to give thanks to his name and declare his testimony among his people. Verse 29. So I pray. And this is what I'm asking you, do you, do I? So I pray for peace within your walls for the sake of my brethren, my friends, and my companions. I will now say, peace be within you, and I will seek your good. How powerful, powerful. God's vision for each church is to be a vibrant place of respect, of security, where you're a safe place of, uh, of love, of peace, of healing, of safety, of trust, a place, a place of friendship, a place of supernatural harmony by the Spirit of God. It's interesting that he uses the words, my friends, my companions, my brothers. Now, you could, this has nothing to do with the size of the congregation. You could be a church of 50, and you, cannot, you can't be close friends with 50 people. There will be people that you are friends with in your journey of faith. There will be people you're companion with. You serve together. You're, and there are people that, that, that it, it, it's, 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 there's a myth out there. Like in my province, a lot of churches are small churches. Uh, so there's a myth out there that the smaller the church, the more love it is. How many of you know that's not true? Some of the small churches and the nastiest churches you can find. It just, everybody knows everybody's business. It's just nasty. And, uh, and it doesn't mean because a church is small that it's not loving. It doesn't mean because it's small that it is loving. It doesn't mean because the church is large that it is not loving. It doesn't mean because the church is large that it is loving. In a church of uh, like Times Square Church, we have friends, we have companions, but we remember that everyone else is a brother. Everyone else is a sister. It is not, hey, it does not speak here. It does not speak here of being brother being brought together by blood human blood it speaks of brethren of the people of God it speaks we are not brought together because of blood we are brought together because of his blood because of his uh, his sacrifice our call our cause our mission the love we have in common the calling we have in common the grace we have in common the forgiveness we have in common and the mercy God poured on us that we ha have in common how good it is you're my brother the church down the street can be different in some ways but if they love Christ they proclaim the word in a uh, without changing it with an unalterated word and they love Jesus and they lift them up they are my brother they are my sister and we are the body of Christ in this city say yes please please don't the, the scripture teaches a big, big difference between unity uniformity or unanimity you know, unity is coming together, uh, and it doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean everybody has to be exactly the same. Some uh, people's version of unity is you have to be like me, think like me, do what I say, be like me. That's the way we're going to be united. No, different. That, what, what a, uh, unity is not being uh, uniformly together, and it's not being unanimous either. And uh, I, I, I oversee over 100 churches, and sometimes in smaller churches, the idea is if we're going to do anything, everybody has to be 100% in agreement on everything. In the reduced kingdom of uh, unanimous, the dissident is king. If, if, we, if we have to everybody agree on everything before we move, the one who is against everybody runs everybody. I want to say to you, uh, I want to say to us, we don't have to have the same opinion on everything. We don't have to have the same uh, uh, background and uh, not at all. To the opposite, God brings us together with our differences and with everything. Uh, but we are united by the spirit of Christ, the love of Christ, all the calling of God and our mission together. Say yes, please. The, uh, the New Testament teaches this so powerfully. 
The book of Romans was, was under attack, was in, in grave danger of exploding in division over legal, legalistic matter, over matters of what, what meat to, meats to eat because of the, the law and what do we keep from the law and what do we, uh, and drinks and different things. And Romans 4, 14, 16 to 19, the apostle Paul uh, teaches to the, in the new covenant how good, how blessed it is for people to dwell together. He says, for the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in peace and unity, he is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which makes for peace and the things I'm pursuing, coming to church, pursuing the things by which I may build up another. And then he says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food and drink or laws. Do not tear up the people of God because of legalism. The, the fruit of the Spirit the evidence, the manifestation of the Spirit is peace. It is love. It is gentleness and kindness and goodness. It is patience, self-control, and joy. One of the, most, one of the worst aberration and the, un, the ugliest monster, the ugliest beast of, that has been tearing up Christianity is when believers actually divide and tear each other up over the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is to unite us. It is, and, and, and in, it, it has been through one, one of the, the devil's heaviest, heaviest attack and, and, and most, 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 most devastating trap over the centuries that over, over people, I, I, we have 100 churches to, uh, under our care and I've traveled all over the world and the churches will divide over the, 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 the things that, to, what they perceive to be, the, that's the only way it can be, that's the only way we can worship, that's the only way we can dress in church, that's the only way we, that's the only way. The uh, Church of Rome was about to explode over this and the Apostle Paul calls them, the Apostle Paul uh, cries out to them, reminds them that he, that pursues unity he that pursues peace he that majors in the majors and 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 stays uh, focused on building the body of Christ and winning souls he's the one who's acceptable to God he's the one who's a mature in faith say yes please he said literally uh, the uh, it's a it's a reminding of why we come together and literally there's a revealing to the to our unity not only says be reminded this is why we came hey, can you imagine what God could do in this body if every Sunday for till Jesus come that I start by next week and the following we say every week every Sunday you came to church with a sense of how can I bless how can I be of peace how can I help how can I serve how can I with my conversation edify somebody build someone I cannot how how can I build bridge? How can I live out how good it is for brethren to come together? You're different than me. I'm different than you. We come from different backgrounds, but we have the same Father and the blood of Christ has saved us and the Spirit of God unites us. Say yes, please. The psalmist says, it, be reminded of this, but also there's a reminding of the unity, but also a revealing. He says, that's why he says uh, uh, in verse 2, it, how amazing it is for brethren to dwell together. Then he gives two, uh, two illustrations, two pictures that we'll look at together. Maybe you haven't understood before. He says, it is like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edges of, on the edge of his garments. When I taught this at our church, we have hundred, not, almost 90% of every, everyone in our church has accepted the Lord in our church. And we have hundreds and hundreds of really new Christians. And when you go with a text like this, you say, "How? Oh, listen to me. It's, good. it's so beautiful. Unity is amazing. Unity is so beautiful. It's like oil that was poured out the head upon the head of Aaron. And it ran down his beard. We have a lot, we had a lot, of, we have a lot of hipsters in our church, all wearing beards. Uh, going down his beard on his garment. And, and nobody says amen. Everybody's just like, whoa. Okay, whatever. I don't know what that means. I don't know why that is so beautiful. Oh, don't act like that. You don't know either, most of you. <laughs> well, to them it meant a lot. To the people of God at the time, they understood. It was a powerful picture. They knew and understood so well. 
It brought them back to the consecration of Aaron. When Aaron was called to serve alongside Moses, to come and serve him, to come and be in unity with him, to come and to be his brother, to be his helper, to be chosen, set apart for the kingdom, set apart as a chosen. This is how God, God would say, the oil uh, was costly. It was made of the, the most excellent, the most costly ingredients. There was no shortcuts. And it uh, represented the anointing, the approval of God. The oil uh, represented the blessing of God, the favor of God. It represented uh, God's flow of life upon his servant. It represented God saying, this one I've set apart. This is somebody. This is, this is revealing who I am blessing, who I am using. Now, most commentaries are shocking. We think of some sprinkling. But most commentaries will agree uh, when they look at the measures of the living of Leviticus and, and the books of the Old Testament that it was something like 750 ounces of oil. It was, a, it was just dripping. It, was just, it came down dripping on his garment. Everybody can smell it. It marked him. Uh, and you have moments all through the Old Testament that, that remind us, I repeated of this, like Leviticus, so some of you taking notes, Leviticus 8, verse 10 to 12. And Moses took, took the anointed oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated it. He sprinkled it on, uh, 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 of it on the altar seven times, anointed the altar and all its utensils, the laver and its base to consecrate them. And he poured uh, some of the anointed oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. God says everything that is done, everything that is done, every instrument, every song, every person in the choir has to be operating in the spirit of unity. Everybody has to be serving with the oil. That's what sets my people apart. They are part of something. They, uh, they honor the body of Christ. They love the body of Christ. They are careful how they speak, how they act. They are looking to bless. Eric, that is what gives life. That, that's what's revealed who my servant is. And that's what reveal who is approved of God. That's, who, that's how you, you want to know. Is someone walking in the blessing of God? Is he a peacemaker? Does he speak well of others? Is he kind? Is she kind? You're not saying amen. This is great preaching right now. Uh, <laughs> if I need to, I'll amen myself. I could go sit there and amen myself. Do you want to know if this is a man of God, approved of God? Uh, if a singer is approved of God? If a choir is approved of God? If a musician is approved of God? Beyond his talent or her talent and beyond, beyond the goosebumps, when they're off the stage, how do they speak? How do they love? How kind are they? How loving are they? How supportive are they of church? Say yes, please. That's how we know. God says that's how you set them apart. That's how, that's the consecration. That's the revealing. And there's a dimension, uh, there's a principle, there are many op uh, principles in operation here. The oil came down from the head of Aaron and all down his garment. The head in the scripture speaks of authority. It speaks not of authority in the sense of, of pushing down or of controlling. No, sense of responsibility. It speaks to every mom. Every dad in this place, what oil are you communicating? What oil are you imparting? It speaks to every mature believer in this place. It speaks to every leader. It speaks to everyone that has any authority. Everybody smells something. When Aaron would walk, he would smell. And it was a reminder, I'm, this is my purpose. Uh, the oil that is upon me. And even his beautiful garment uh, to, the, to, the, to the human eye. He said, oh, it's too bad. His beautiful garment is, uh, is, is covered with oil. No, he's saying, no matter what your garment is exteriorly, it better be soaked with unity. It better be soaked with love for God and the body and the church and the pastors and the leaders and the body of Christ. This is how you know that I've set you apart. Say yes, please. Jesus taught this. Jesus taught this. And always under grace, he taught it deeper. John 15, verse 8 to 11. You can look it up at home. If you bear, uh, if you bear, if you bear much fruit, that is how my Father is glorified and you are called my disciples. You have to bear fruit of love. As the Father loved me, and I have loved my Father, and I also loved you, abide, rest, stay, persevere in my love. If you keep my commandments of love, you will abide in my love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Very clear. This is not mystical. It is not something that's just in theory or in songs as we sang more than anthems. 
My commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love as no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. This, pa this passage is so amazing. He says, it is the fruit, the oil of love and unity that glorifies the Father. Beyond everything else we do. You, you, you've known this to be true. You've known somebody who testifies of his faith very well. They know the four spiritual laws. And they, they're very zealous in testifying for their faith. But at the same time, they have a bitter dividing spirit. You've, you've seen somebody who can play or sing or who very, is very gifted. Or somebody who knows the scriptures so well. But they, have, they don't smell like oil. They smell like vinegar. There's a smell of it. And, and, and the, the Father's not being glorified. And you, he says, you want to know how my Father's glorified? You bear much fruit of love. It is the fruit, the oil of love and unity that identifies us. This is how they'll know that you're my disciples. It is the true, it is the true, the love uh, and the oil of the, uh, the, the, the love of the Father for the Son. This, this blew my mind. It is the love, Jesus says, as my Father loved me, as I loved him, and as I loved you, this is how you are to love one another. That's the standard. Our standard is not, am I less, less bitter than before? Uh, uh, she's worse than me. I'm, I'm better than before. Uh, he's worse than me. She's worse. We're not comparing ourselves to one another to human standards or human love. It is only possible through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. The love of God poured out in our hearts by the Spirit because the, the, this is something after over 30 years and more of walking with the Lord I've begun. I don't remember in the years past praying like this, but I'm praying over my own life now. now almost every day I'm praying, Lord, I, it's completely unattainable for me. It's completely out of reach for me. But how? As Jesus loved me, and as you loved your son, and as the son loved you, and as Jesus laid out his life and poured out his life, for, oh God, I, that's my standard. That's how you want me to love. So help me today by the Holy Spirit in my words, in my minds, in my attitudes to release what needs to be released, that I would walk in your love. Say yes, please, body of Christ. There's a reminding, and then there's a revealing. It reveals who's really, and it's very important uh, principles that the, the key principles to remember with the oil of unity. It reveals who we are. It reproduces in others. It reproduces in others. It's astonishing when you're pastoring as long as I have in the same nation, same place. I now have sons and grandsons of people I led to the Lord, and oftentimes. The father who was a Christian, but a bitter man, a harsh man, a legalistic man, a cutting man, an explosive man, a choleric man, his son's the same. Grandsons are the same. They're in church, but they had that spirit. And the reverse is true. The opposite is absolutely true. You communicate. It comes down my head. So that's my other prayer. Oh, God, for my own family around the table, my sons, now my grandkids, for my spiritual sons in the faith, for all the pastors looking at me, for all the young men, 300 students at our Bible school that we train. My God, let the oil of unity, love for your body, forgiveness, grace, and maturity flow from me. To everybody I touch, say yes, please. It reveals who we are, it reproduces in others, and it must be renewed. One of the things that's astonishing is that that was the calling of Aaron. Aaron was called to be uh, united with Moses, to support him, uh, uh, to be pa uh, partaker with him of the calling. But the Bible says that Aaron forsook that calling. He forsook the calling to unity. He let it go. He didn't lose it. He let it go. It drifted away. He did not uh, nurture it. And there's an amazing picture in Numbers uh, chapter 12 where it says that Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman who had he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard, heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble and more than very patient, more than all men who were on the face of the earth at the time. But suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out, three, the three of you, to the tabernacle of meeting, the tent of meeting. So they came out, and the Lord came down in the pillow of cloud and stood. And there's a, there's a correction of, that takes place. And the Bible says in verse 9 of Numbers 12 that the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and leprosy broke 
over their faces. And the Bible says that they were set aside and until they repented and until they came back to unity, the entire people could not advance. The whole body was stopped because there was disunity. And the Apostle Paul in the New Covenant says, these things are for your teaching. These things are for your edification. The psalmist says, you're looking for the blessing. You want the blessing to continue. You want the blessing to multiply and to increase. You wonder why the blessing seems to be removed. This is where the blessing is. Aaron had it. He forsook it. And as he forsook it, a whole body was stopped. A whole body was stopped. I say thank God for the blessing over Times Square Church over these uh, uh, decades. But we say, God, we have a responsibility today. We don't want to stop. We don't want to deviate in any way. We want to grow in your blessing. We want to grow as we walk together. Say yes, please. And that's the second picture. He says it has to be renewed. The renewing of our unity. He says it's like the dew of Hermon. Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there, that's the place that the Lord commanded the blessing life forevermore. Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in Israel. Almost uh, 30,000 feet above sea level. I've been there. It's magnificent. It's at the northern, northern extremity of the country near the border of Syria. And the source of the Jordan, at the feet of the, uh, of the mountains, the source of the Jordan River that would irrigate the awfully dry and desertic lands came from the melting of the perpetual snow cap caps at the top of Mount Hermon. And the waters and the dew, still to this day, they would come down, literally physically mount Mount Hermon, and they would give life to everything they touched. Had to be renewed because one thing we know about dew is yesterday's dew, yesterday's water, provision cannot sustain us today. You see, that's what David is saying. He's saying it's like, it's, it's like oil. It's like the wonderful anointing of God and God setting you apart. This is how he reveals. This is how God reveals who he's with, who he backs, who he approves of, who he uses. Not their gifting, their talents, their knowledge. No, this is how he, but he, he, he says it's also like, it's like that, that dew that came out. It's like that, that water that came, came down from Hermon and gave life to everything. It is like the dew of Hermon. The unity and love which gave us life yesterday must be renewed today. Yesterday's unity cannot feed and heal and grow life today. The dew of unity gives life. Without it, it's death. But with the dew of unity, everything, our worship, our praise, our witness, the healing power of God, the, the provision of God, everything whew, is life. Everything is renewed. Everything comes to life. Everything finds life again. So it calls, to, it calls for a, 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 a few questions. Are you in need of renewing your heart of unity? Was there a season in your life where your love for the body, where your your kindness and your openness to others and your, and your capacity by God to release things, offenses and, and, and hurts to, to focus on what God has called you to be and to be what, what you thought of, of loving and forgiving and being kind as a priority, but, but some things have happened or years have come. And, and, and you, you, yesterday's dew of unity blessed your life, but is a bitter, strifeful spirit entered in. Are you in need? What, 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 is your, what is to be your response? Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he said, 1 and 2, he says, Offer your life a living sacrifice by the renewing, of, which is holy and acceptable, before God, by the renewing of your mind, which will be your reasonable service. And David says, how good it is for brethren to come together. That's, that's where, if, if that's true, if this is true, this is what God wants us to, to bring back and remind ourselves and, and be renewed in. It's, it's what sets us apart as a people. If that's the place where God blesses, well, then I have a response. I have a decision to make every day of my life. Will I be a life breaker or will I be a life builder? Now, I could take you through the Psalms, and I did. I went through, through many, many Psalms that we would not turn to, but you will recognize is that because David always spoke from experience. The Psalms are out of his life's experience and he, he was around. He was one and then he was around people that broke lives every day in church, in the body, in the believers and he was around people that build lives and he, and he describes them, those that break lives. I'm reading you portions of the Psalms. Their words 
wound us and do much harm. Their bitterness and conversations are like poison, like a sharp dagger. They are, they are bound by their pride. This, this was so, so uh, uh, struck me. They are bound by their pride. They, had clo they have closed their hearts. They have stopped to seek to speak and act with, with wisdom or to, with kindness. They have abandoned the will to heal and to do good. The church is in horrible danger. And it is hurting terribly when you have believers that have lost the purpose. They have lost the will to be kind and to forgive. They have, they have accepted to live with their bitterness. And their pride, he says, they're bound by their pride. They're just too proud to say, I'm sorry. They're just too proud. Now, that's a good question for all of us. Is it hard for you to say, you know what? I should have said, that. I'm sorry. Or are you, uh, do you all of a sudden become a, a, a lawyer? You, you build up your case and we have to have footage and videos and jurisprudence to try to get you to admit anything. Oh, come on. Uh, say to somebody next to you, he's not talking about you. Say that to somebody next to you. <laughs> uh, maybe he is. No, no you, you, they, they, I say, oh, God, guard me, protect me. Oh, God, change me, break me. If I'm in that place with my own wife, with my children, with the people that I work with in church, that place where my, my pride binds me, my, I'm shutting my, my, my heart. I, I'm, not, I'm not driven now. I'm not pursued. I, I'm not passionate now about just uh, being a blessing to people. I just, uh, I'm just careless about it. I say, God, make my heart tender again. So I say, sorry, I'm sorry, forgive me, and pray, pray with me that I would be better, speak better, love better, be kind better. Say yes, please. <laughs> David, David said, my, my, they, they, they literally, those that break lives in, in the body, they literally make the anointing, they, 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 the true blessing because of them becomes impossible. That's the place of blessing. In Psalm 62, 4, he says, they bless with their mouths, but they have curses and bitterness in their hearts. In Psalm 55, 15, he says, David said, if it was a stranger, if it was somebody who doesn't know God, if it was a stranger who came to hurt me, then I would have buried it. I could have walked away from him. But it was you, my friend. It was you, my companion. We took sweet counsel together. We walked together to the house of God among God's people. Do you realize when I read this as a pastor, I realized that David, the man who won, um, the man of a thousand battles, his deepest wounds were in church. And I want you to, to know that one of the main, one, one grave reasons why so many have left evangelical churches is because they came with hope. They came from a broken, divided, prejudiced, torn up, uh, a bitter world and, and, and to a church that announced love and spoke of love and believed it and was so desperately thirsting for it. And they came in oftentimes to find the same stuff and the same. And, that, and I want to tell you that that is what will bring thousands and thousands back in this day, in this moment in our history where forces are trying to set and pit us against one community against the other. Where, where, where crowds and throngs will walk right up, a crowd, right up in front of the church and say, kill cops. Or walk right in front of the church and, spe and spew stuff we say that spirit will not come here we pray for cops we pray for victims we pray for whites and yellows and browns and we pray for blacks and we pray for our city and we pray not in this place in this place it will be people loving forgiving praying building each other up and welcoming you wherever you come from oh please say yes Those that break lives, that's our reasonable response. Will I be one who breaks lives or builds lives? I close with this as the musicians come. He says this is the place where God commands the blessing. There'll be a flow of life forevermore. And then David describes in many of the Psalms, I'm just reading one or two verses, that what they're like. He says they, they, they pray, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. They pray, like in Psalm 65, if I had kept poison in my heart, I know you could not have blessed me. I have to let it go. I have to release the offense if I want the blessing to flow. They pray, who shall ascend before the king to please him, to remain in his presence? He who speaks truth in his heart, he or she who will not cause harm to his brother or sister, he who honors those that fear the Lord. 
The Bible puts such an emphasis and warns us against flattering lips, but calls us to give honor to whom honor is due. Say to somebody next to you sincerely, I honor you in the Lord. We honor, we don't, we don't, we don't flaunt, we don't, we don't, we're not proudful. We honor our pastors. We honor the servants of God. We honor men that have served for years and years. We honor the sacrifice. We honor one another. We honor those that serve us. We honor and love. And then we honor whoever comes in here and loves the name uh, of the Lord. We, we receive you. And, uh, and the Psalm, Psalm 141, uh, uh, this I'm giving you the reference because I'm, I'm giving you a homework. Go read it. It's amazing. Psalm 141. Lord, as I lift my hands in sacrifice, I cry out, set a guard, O Lord over my mouth and keep watch over the doors of my lips it actually means one amazing position of worship could be this you know what I mean too many believers with hands up no guard at the mouth at the same time at the same time oh God I will lift my hands yes but God put a guard at my lips that I would bless and edify and encourage and Psalm 141, just for good measure, finishes with this. If the righteous corrects me, it shall be a blessing to me. An excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. The three person who said hallelujah is because they love being corrected. I want to hear an hallelujah from this side. Oh God, bring correction in my life. Bring correction in my life that the oil would flow. We're going to have a, I believe we're going to have a baby dedication in a few minutes. What an amazing thought as these parents will come, musicians come to us. The parents will come and present their children to the Lord. You understand that they're also presenting themselves to God. And this church has to stop and ponder and say, what testimony will we live out in front of these kids as they grow up in this church? What kind of love would we have? How will we speak of other communities? How will we speak uh, of one another? How will we react when we are hurt? How will we react when we don't understand? How we, what, what model will we give to these children as they grow up in the house of God? My prayer, my heart, my cry is that we would say that these children that we will offer to God and the parents and their families as we rejoice with them and commit them to the Lord, that we, they would grow up in a church that lives out how good how beautiful it is for men and women, for, ch for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the oil of anointing that came down Aaron's beard. It's like the dew. It is renewed and it gives life to everything it touches. It is the place where God has blessed us and blessed us more. It is the place where life flows forever and evermore. In Jesus' name and all God's people say amen. 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 Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask Greg to lead us in a minute. But just before we go, and uh, the dedication, the baby dedication will be so precious, but we have to stop. We have to, to respond. What is our response? I want you to bow your heads with me, please. And I had a special moment of prayer in my mind for, I believe, led of the Lord for thee as we close this service. Would you listen to me one more, just one more minute as you bow your head? Main floor, balcony in our annex, in the different campuses in New Jersey, and also the tens of thousands who will see this message around the world. What will be your response today? Will you join us in praying, Lord, remind me every time I come to your house, let me sing the Psalms of Ascent. Let me remind my heart, refocus my heart when, when all I hear at work and on, on network television and my family and on the, on the subway and everywhere where all I hear is tearing down to lift, each other, to lift one up and trying to divide to conquer, lifting up walls between each other. Oh my God, I pray this message will stay with me. I pray that I will prepare myself as I come into your house every day 
in your presence. How good it is. How blessed it is. How pleasing to you it is. When we dwell together in, pure, in unity and in purity and in, in forgiveness and in love and in acceptance. Lord, I'm asking you for the supernatural strength to release offenses. Would you pray with me all over this place? Begin to pray, all our voices together. Lord, we want to release whatever offenses. Some are, some are deep. Some have caused us to be leery of trusting anyone. But I pray, oh God, that you, by the Holy Spirit, the flow of your love in our hearts, the redeeming power of God that we would release. I pray, oh God, that that oil would, would flow on us again, the oil of unity, that we would not be errant that we would not forsake it, that we would not walk away from it, that we would not begin to... We would not have our faces, our hearts, our testimonies before you be marked by the leprosy of disunity. That we would not stop your life flow in our family or in our marriage or in my couple, in my marriage, with my spouse, with my kids or grandkids. I pray for unity in families. I pray for unity with our children. I pray for unity in the church. I pray for unity in the different communities in our city and in our nation. People of God, would you join me in praying for your nation? We're not being political. We're being spiritual. Oh, God, by your spirit, your spirit, oh, God, bring peace to our nation. Protect, oh, God. We pray for victims. We pray for families of victims. We pray for comfort. We pray, oh God, for divine strength and forgiveness and peace and love and the capacity not to respond to hatred with hatred, not to respond to injustice with injustice, not to respond with a sense of revenge, but with a sense of release and redemption. Oh God, I pray for this oil on my life. And if I've become too, too proud, too proud to say I'm sorry if I've closed my heart, if I've shut my bowels. Oh God, forgive me, change me, come deep in me. Oh Lord, redo, renew unity in my heart like a fresh dew. My heart has been like a desert, it's been parched, it's been dry. Bearing little fruit because of it, restore the blessing. Restore the blessing over my life. Oh God, you say you command your blessing upon unity. So we pray in faith, command your blessing over our children, command your blessing over our grandchildren, command your blessing over our families, our marriages, our church, our city and our nation. In the name of Jesus. Father God, we stand, we stand with Pastor Carter, we stand with every pastor on this staff, their wives, their family, every elder, leaders of ministry. Father, as Pastor Carter comes back from a time of rest, may he find a church that is standing with him like never before, a church that is holding up his arms, a church that is supporting, a church that is loving, a church that's saying, Pastor, how good it is for us to dwell together with you and to build together with you and to push back hell together with you and to set lives free together with you and Jesus. We're coming together, oh God, and we are praying how good it is, how beautiful it is for us to dwell together. Command your blessing upon us in Jesus' name. In the last minutes of this service, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Patrick. Would you, with great respect, don't force anyone, but just for a minute, would you just gather in groups of two or three and just pray over one another? Just pray together in unity all over this place. Husband, wives, friends, just in small groups all over the place, just praying for one another. My house will be a house of prayer. In Acts chapter 4, they all began to raise their voices together. And as they lifted their voices together, the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit again. Would you begin just to pray blessing? Just pray blessing and unity. Blessing and unity. Blessing and unity over your church, over the family. Some, some people, some friends that you are praying for, there's great, great hurt with the kids. There's great hurts with teenagers, great hurt with adult kids. There's been divorce and the scars of divorce. There's been strife in the family. There's been injustice, prejudice against them. They need supernatural power to release and to love.
people of God, how good it is for us to dwell together, to pray together. For that is the place where God will command a blessing. Protect the blessing of our Times Square Church, oh God, for years to come. Let no strife, let no dividers, let no life breakers come and wound this body. Let this body grow in love, in unity and in purpose together in prayer. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus.